thanks for sticking around till five o'clock for the very last session. Um, I'm going to be doing contributing without code. So this session, just to make sure you're in the right place, is for people that have been using Drupal for a while, kind of know how Drupal works, kind of know what go is going on with Drupal, but haven't become an active part of the community. Kind of have sat on the sidelines, watched everything else go on, and you know, are trying to figure out a way to, you know, jump in with all those people that are so passionate about Drupal and figure out why they're why they're passionate and why they get so excited about Drupal. So a little bit about me. Um, you can find me on Drupal.org if you want to get in touch with me. Uh, Twitter is also a great place to get in touch with me. And um, as far as work goes, I work for a small Drupal company in San Francisco. We do almost all Drupal development besides a few really old legacy sites. And um, we do a lot of Drupal 7 sites now. We've moved pretty much entirely to Drupal 7. So if you custom Drupal 7 modules, that kind of thing. That's, that's what we do. So the motivation for this um, presentation, I've been doing Drupal for almost five years now. And when I started, I just showed up at a job one day. I said, I know HTML and CSS. And they say, do you know Drupal? And they say, and I, I was, I, I don't even know what that means. And they pointed me to the handbook pages. That was Drupal five day, uh, Drupal four days actually. So the handbook was it. That was my only source of information. So I just jumped in, started reading every page of the handbook and tried to teach myself Drupal. So over the course of five years, I went from just a person trying to put together Drupal sites to a themer, and now I'm pretty much doing all module development. So it may seem intimidating now, but over, over time, you can learn a lot with Drupal and through Drupal. So um, learning Drupal can be extremely hard. Uh, people used to talk about a learning curve, and lately they've been talking about a learning cliff. So um, getting from the point where you first understand Drupal, first introduced to Drupal, to the point where you can actually do something really effective with Drupal can be really difficult, you know, a lot like climbing up a big cliff. But the good part is we have a giant community, probably one of the biggest open source communities that's out there, and there's a lot of help out there. And the great part is, is you can also be part of that help. Um, anybody that's just one step behind you climbing up that cliff, one step behind you on that ladder, you can help that person on, on the next step and, you know, help out the rest of the community along the way. And so the biggest thing to remember when you're working with Drupal, when you're working within the community, is just to stay positive. It's really easy to get really frustrated. You saw me slouch down in my chair in that first slide. It's, it's a frustrating piece of software to work with. You know, it doesn't always work as advertised. It doesn't always work as you intend it. So if you can keep a positive attitude anytime you're interacting with other people from the community, instead of you know, going on the attack, you're always gonna get better results. So um, some people you know, jump in immediately saying, you wrote this API totally wrong. You know, rewrite it from scratch. You guys don't know what you're doing. Those Zen guys over there with their framework, they know what they're doing. And that's, that's not gonna get you anywhere. So stay positive in the interactions you have with the rest of the community. And that's because um, right now, while we're talking, a lot of the core contributors are over in a session talking about burnout. Um, it's, it's easy with all the requests that are coming in, all the people that are asking you questions to get really burned out with your contributions to Drupal. But one positive comment, one positive action from a user, you know, one person offering to help you out might be all it takes to you know, push you past that and, and keep doing effective contributions to Drupal. So to get started, um, you're in the best possible place to get started. Uh, one of the you know, initial points for me to get involved with the community was DrupalCon Boston back in 2008. Um, you come to an event like this, you're gonna meet lots of people, you're gonna find lots of different niches in Drupal that you can contribute to, you can find lots of different um, parts of the community, you can meet a lot of people from the community. Um, when you're online, everybody's just a username, and it's easy to dehumanize that and think this person's just a coding robot that codes in their sleep and puts all this stuff together, and you come to one of these events and you realize that's just a person that you know, doesn't have a lot of free time left, but they you know, are really passionate about Drupal, they love writing code, and that's, that's what they do. Um, the next thing you can do is sign up for a Drupal.org account. I think you had to to register for London, so you guys are all, all set there. And um, so I go through the steps on how to do that, but you're all set. And so then the next step you come to is, well, wait a minute, isn't you know, Drupal written in PHP and JavaScript and HTML? Um, I don't know how to do any of that. So where, where can I get involved? You know, where can I s step in to help people out? 
the vast majority of people that use Drupal are just like that. They don't know any of the coding languages. They don't know any code at all. They just want to piece together a site with all the modules that are out there. They come to Drupal because it you know, advertises on those pages. It can do this, it can do that, and all you have to do is download it and unpack it in a directory and you're done. So those people, every single person, if they successfully set up a Drupal site, successfully installed a module, successfully done anything with Drupal, they can help somebody else out that can't even figure that much out. So the areas I'm going to cover are um, advocacy, design, documentation, project management, support, testing, and translation. So those are a lot of things you'd hear in any sort of software development process, and a lot of people take it for granted in the Drupal community. When I was just starting out, I kind of just figured that stuff just happened on its own. Nobody spent time on it. But a lot of times what happens is the coders that are writing the best features for Drupal, the coolest modules, working on you know, contributing to core, are also being their own project managers, are also offering support to all the users. And that's a, you know, a, a burden that other people can take off their shoulders because it's work that you know, can easily be done by somebody that doesn't know how to write code. So to help advocate for Drupal, um, you can join a group near you. Um, there's a lot of local users groups, and there's new ones every week, every day almost. Uh, go to groups.drupal.org. You can also just go to an outside group. You know, if, if you're really passionate about Drupal, if you really love Drupal, you just go to a PHP group or a JavaScript group. And you know, a lot of times, I think there's a general attitude in outside software community. They look at the code behind Drupal. It's 10 years old. It's got a lot of legacy stuff in there. And they kind of think, you know, why would anybody want to use this? So it's good for them to hear you know, I like using Drupal because it offers me all these features, or I like using Drupal because of this. So just keeping that, you know, those words out there, you know, keeping people excited about Drupal is a good way to um, kind of change that perception because it's not all about how pristine the code looks on the back end. It's also about the experience you get using the software. And that's a good way to also introduce new people to Drupal. I think a lot of people have heard about it by now. You know, there are very few people that haven't heard about it but you can bring somebody in that maybe wouldn't have tried it out otherwise, would have used a competing system. So here's some pictures of you know, different types of events. Um, bottom left is DrupalCon San Francisco, where you know, have almost 3,000 people, and you know, that's, it's been feeling like that in here today. I'm sure you guys have felt the crowd. And, but you can also you know, just have six people around a table with beers talking about Drupal. So the size of the event, the type of the event, isn't really, it's just up to the organizers and up to you in terms of like how you want to interact with the rest of the community. So um, an area of Drupal that uh, people probably don't know about that needs a lot of help is design. Um, Drupal events like these, if you've been noticing the posters, the t-shirts, the stickers, the buttons, the logos all over the place. Somebody probably volunteered their time to design that if you know they weren't working for a company that got contracted to do it. And that's a good way for a designer to get their name out there, get some good um, material for their own portfolio. So that's a good way for designers to jump in to the Drupal community. Another place where we need a lot of designer help is um, their expertise in usability, user interface, and interaction. Uh, developers tend to write whatever is quickest and easiest when it comes to an interface. And as long as the checkboxes are there, as long as that menu is there, the feature is done in their mind. But if the checkboxes could be switched for a drop-down menu and it would make it 10 times easier, the developer may not think that way, may not notice that. And so all it takes is a designer coming in with one issue saying, can you switch this from a checkbox to a drop-down menu? That developer changes one line of code and it makes the module infinitely easier to use. So don't be shy if you're a designer to speak up on issue queues with specific suggestions about what can be changed. Sketches, wireframes, any of that kind of stuff is it's immensely helpful for developers that don't know that information themselves. And also, um, Drupal, if you compare it to WordPress and the number of themes that you see in the theme directory, if a designer really wants to make their name stand out, they, all they got to do is put a decent Drupal theme up there, and immediately they're going to get job offers from 20 people. It's, it's finding a good Drupal themer is you know, extremely difficult, and that's a great way to get your name out there. So here's some examples of some of the logos and collateral that people have created. So it's also a nice spot. You know, a lot of times as a designer, you're um, working on client work. They're telling you what to do. And uh, if you notice, um, the Drupal community isn't going to tell you what you can and can't do. You can get pretty creative and crazy with whatever you want to do. So it can be a fun thing for a designer to design a logo for a Drupal camp or a Drupal meetup. 
Uh, this is a great place to get involved in usability with Drupal. I know the page itself probably isn't very appealing to designer aesthetic, but um, you, the Prairie Initiative is trying to uh, lower you know, barriers to contribution on Drupal.org itself. So um, there's a lot of I discussions around the usability of the issue queue on Drupal.org, the usability of the Drupal.org site itself, the usability of all those features on there. And so it's you know an extremely high profile site. Drupal.org gets a whole lot of traffic. So you get an opportunity as a designer, you know, as a usability expert to work on a, a large site and help push forward some of those features. There's the theme directory for anybody that doesn't know where to find that. And um, all you need to do is you have to go through the same process as a coder, but it's much easier to get approved. You create your theme, you create an issue saying, I want to contribute to Drupal.org. Somebody will look through the code, make sure you know you don't have JavaScript bugs in there that are going to open up cookies or some security issue, and um, you'll probably get approved pretty quickly. Documentation is another place where um, anybody that's learned Drupal knows there's a lot of room for help. Anybody can jump in. If you guys all have your Drupal.org accounts, so you all can go in right now and edit 90% of the documentation on Drupal.org yourself. All you need to do is head to a documentation page, click that edit button that you'll see when you're logged in, and immediately you get um, a node edit form, which every Drupal user is painfully familiar with. And you can scroll down and, s and start making the changes. The only required field is you have to give a log message saying what your motivation was w for making the change, just so somebody can go through. If they didn't like the change that you made, they can revert back to a previous version. Project management is, um, for me, when I, s when I started contributing, it took me um, a long time. I used Drupal probably for three years before I even made any effort at contributing anything back. And um, this was probably the most surprising for me. Once I did start contributing some code to Drupal, the amount of effort that is involved. If you run a, a reasonably popular contributed module, you can get 10, 20 issues a day on, on your issue queue. So um, project management is needed just to keep track of all those feature requests that are coming in, seeing where there's duplicates, seeing where they, um, where there's new problems that are coming up that are actual bugs versus problems that are just problems with documentation that need, need to be cleared up. So if you, if you look on any project, just to introduce you to the issue queue a little bit, um, this is where most of the work in Drupal happens, both in contributed modules and in Drupal core. So there's recent issues as well as an issue search box on every project. You go in and you have ways to break down these issues by versions of Drupal as well as you know, the component of Drupal, and you'll, they'll be sorted by most recent. And so if you look, um, this is an example of just some issue I helped out with. The user has a, a pretty simple request, you know, it's pretty much just a documentation request, but the module development developer doesn't have to uh, answer this question. Anybody that knows how to use the module can go in and answer the question, and the vast majority of issues on almost any issue queue are that kind of thing. It's anybody that successfully installed the module can probably help out. Maybe it's a little more complicated, but it's um, a lot of times it's just parsing what uh, is a pretty complicated explanation and turning it into a decent answer. Another way you can help people out is just by offering support. Um, anybody that was just in the previous session uh, down in the main concert hall, there was some talk about the forums being pretty much abandoned. Um, so it's a lot of users helping out each other, but that's not necessarily a bad thing because if a developer goes in with an explanation about how to do something in Drupal, they're thinking about the code that underlies that feature, not the, the steps a beginner would take to check the checkboxes and make it happen. So the forums is a great place just to jump in as a new user and help answer other people's questions. And you'll end up learning a lot just by answering those questions. The issue queues, like I said in the previous um, slide, just jump in, answer a question, you know, um, read through other people's questions. If you don't know the answer and you can give half an answer, that's better than nothing because then the person filing that feels like they're getting a response back and it's not just a black hole where they send their question. Um, IRC is another place where you can get support. If you're not familiar with IRC, it's a giant chat room where everybody working on Drupal, everybody looking for Drupal support, they all pile into a couple of different chat rooms and ask each other questions right back and forth rapid fire. So if you have something, you know, 
I just took down my client site and I have no idea how to fix it kind of issue that you need to get answered right away, then IRC is a great place to jump in. If you just do a Google search for IRC, you can find an IRC client, client for whatever type of computer you have. And um, on Drupal.org, the IRC chat rooms for Drupal are all listed there. And you can also just offer support in real life. Uh, something we've started up in the local community is we have a users helping users session where a bunch of people sit up, sit around a, ta sit around a table, and um, ask each other questions. And if nobody knows the answer, you can at least point them to the right place to find documentation. But a lot of times, if you get 10 Drupal people together, somebody's ran into the same problem before, and you can help regular users out, and then you just get to socialize a little bit. It's, it's a little bit less impersonal than some of these other areas. So this is an example of what you get in the forums, just a typical forum. But if you look at the uh, number of posts in some of those forums and the number of new posts, you can get an idea of how much stuff is pouring through there. This is probably the number one place new, years, new users to Drupal hit, and it's also almost completely ignored by existing Drupal users. So as a beginner, it's a great place to go help people out that aren't going to probably get help otherwise. And th this shows you um, what you get with IRC. And you know, there's a lot of talk in uh, Drupal Contribute you can see there, which is where a lot of the core developers hang out. It's a good place if you're interested in PHP development just to watch what they're talking about, see what's going on with Drupal 8, and you can learn a lot just by sitting there and reading through it. Um, there's also the Drupal support, if you see down in the bottom. So that's dedicated support channel. There's people there that are you know, in there just to answer questions. And then there's just plain pound Drupal, which is just you know, kind of a lot of support questions. That's probably the one people type in that don't know where any of these channels are, don't know which ones are for which, and they just end up there by default. Here's an example of somebody getting support in real life. I think this was at a DrupalCon a few years back. But um, that's probably the number one way. So if you have any way to um, build a local community, if it doesn't exist already, or get connected with your local community, that'll help you climb that Drupal learning cliff a lot faster than probably any of these other methods. Testing is um, a great way to help, and it doesn't have to be as complicated as you think it is. Um, a lot of times with Drupal, you're doing testing for module developers, even if you don't know it. As soon as you download a module and install it, if there's a bug there and you're the first person to find it, it it's great if you have the ability to quickly and clearly say exactly what happened, what went wrong, and post that on that module's issue queue. Because if 10 people find that, bug and nobody reports it, it's probably going to go on patch for a really long time. Um, explaining yourself well is really the best part. Um, one thing I like to encourage new people to do, if you haven't um, tried this already, for Drupal 6 anyway, you can go download a complete, complete package where you run a copy of Drupal locally from this Acquia site. So you can download a, a complete web server with Drupal inside it. This is a great place to test modules because when you install a module in here, it removes all the dependencies that you have on your existing site. So if you have a large, complicated existing site, you can bring the module in here by itself and test it by itself so you can you know, replicate the issue wh where somebody else could because a module developer isn't going to have access to all of the sub-modules and conflicting modules that you have on your site. So if you can confirm that the issue happens on a standalone site, like the Acquia installer, then you'll get a better idea of if it's a real issue or not. Uh, another thing you can do if you're a little bit more advanced or you, you just you want to get more advanced is learn how to apply patches. A lot of times issues will get fixed in an issue queue and somebody will attach a patch to that issue queue for that specific thing. And so if you're really frustrated with the module, you can't get it working, you can't get it working with the code that's there in the package release, a lot of times you can find the answer in an issue queue. And if you learn how to apply patches with Git, there, I think there's a couple sessions on that here. And, and there's a lot of really good instructions on Drupal.org as well. That allows you to test out cutting edge brand new features, cutting edge brand new um, patches to bugs, and really move um, the m development of that module along. Because if you're a module developer, you're working on a bug, or you have no real sites to test it on usually. You're just testing it on a local copy. And so if somebody can download it, install it, and test it on a development copy of a real site, that can help out a lot. Another area that um, is it's completely detached from what you would 
think of when contributing to Drupal is translating uh, all the content in all of these modules in Drupal core. If you go to uh, localize.drupal.org, there's a whole uh, subsite set up just for contributing back translations of all the strings in every Drupal module. So there's a, a function called the T function in Drupal, and every string in Drupal should be, if it's not, wrapped in a T function. And that means all those strings are available to be translated into one of these 250 some languages that are on localized.drupal.org. But if you see the number of contributors and also the progress for some of these languages is extremely small. So if you speak an obscure language or know somebody that does, it's, it's probably a pretty quick and easy task to go in and translate some of these strings. And the more of that that gets done, then it opens up Drupal to a whole different community of users because they can then download Drupal out download a copy of Drupal, download the translation, and immediately their copy of Drupal will have all of the buttons, all of the text, all of the help text translated into their own language. So why would you want to go through all this extra work, you know, spend your spare time working on Drupal, spend, you know, a lot of extra effort, you know, engaging with the community? Uh, the first benefit is really a greater an understanding of Drupal. There's just a lot of parts of Drupal that you're not going to understand unless you dive in and are actually working on them. And the next time you have a bug with that area of Drupal, you're gonna be figuring it out twice as fast as you would have previously. The second big benefit is you build a network of people that are gonna wanna help you out with your own issues. So if you jump into somebody's issue queue and start answering a bunch of support requests, and then you file your own feature request for a new feature on that module, nine times out of 10, that maintainer is gonna really take your feature request seriously Whereas if you come out of the blue into somebody's feature request, they're gonna just click the postpone button and you might not hear anything else about that feature request. So it's a good way to build up a network of people that are gonna help you out. And it, it makes using Drupal a lot more enjoyable. You kind of get a more, uh, when you're outside of the community, you keep thinking of they. Like they're gonna fix that, they're gonna work on that, they're gonna get that done. And as soon as you jump in and realize that this is all happening with just regular people, either in their spare time or at work, you, you realize that um, it's a more of a we question and it, it feels a lot more sort of attainable to get your problem fixed or get your problem worked on. So everybody needs to grab a shovel because there's a lot of work ahead of us. Here are a bunch of additional resources. I'll post the slides right after this. Um, this links off to pretty much all the handbook pages, a couple of articles people have written about this, um, some of the some of the information covered in the earlier slides. And a lot of, a lot of this is on Drupal.org itself, so that's the first place to look if you wanna find guides for contributing. So that's it, that's um, what I have for my talk. If anybody has questions, I won't drag you, drag it out that much longer. Okay, that's fine. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah, that's really good. I haven't thought about that. So is everyone going to run out and try to jump in? It, it, it's it, the first few issues, the first few um, patches, the first few you know documentation edits are the hardest, and then you realize every time you see a you know see something needs to be changed, every time you see something that needs to be worked on, you just jump in and start doing it, and it just becomes second habit. So. Don't don't slow down. As soon as you get started, just keep plowing through, and eventually you'll you'll make a real dent. All right, thank you. Thank you for coming.